I begin with a quote from Teilhard de Chardin. We might as well start at a very high level. <laughs> I came across this recently. I hadn't known that he had said this, and I'm amazed. Chardin died in 1955, well before the council. And he said this, it has sometimes seemed to me that there are three weak stones settled dangerously in the foundations of the modern church. And then he lists them. First, a government that excludes democracy. Now imagine 1955. Second, a priesthood that minimizes women. Again, 1955. And third, a revelation that excludes further prophecy. A revelation that excludes further prophecy. Now, that's the one I want to talk a bit about tonight. I mean, we know he was a genius, but like, 19, uh, whenever he said that, about 70 years ago at least, and now all three of them are major issues in the church. Now we know we have other issues like the clerical sex abuse and all that sort of thing, and you know as much about that as I do, because basically you here and we in Ireland have been through the same experiences. But I think the Shabbat's third one, the revelation that, ex that excludes future prophecy, is actually going to become the major issue for the Catholic Church and the one that will decide ultimately whether the Church has a future. And for me at this stage, that's a real question because I think the challenge is going to be enormous. I quote a bit from Irish writers on the topic. I know you have your own here in America and I know that I don't quite know how to pronounce her name. Delio or Delio? And you had her here yes. a few years ago. Yes. And a lot of what I'll be saying will be similar enough to what she says. But as I say, I'll be quoting. In particular, two Irish writers, a man called John Feehan. Now, you'd never have heard of John Feehan because I'm not aware that he's known much outside of Ireland. John is an ecologist. A layman, but he is also a theologian, and he is writing some marvelous stuff on this whole area nowadays. So he's one I quote from. And the second one is a guy called Diarmad Omaraku. Now get your tongue around that one. Yes. Some of you are familiar with it. Now, actually, in English, it's Diarmad Murphy. <laughs> Diarmad Omaraku is the Irish version, but he goes by that, yes. and he's great writing. Incredible. I can't understand how Diarmuid Morocco hasn't been silenced because he's a thousand times more radical than anything I ever said, and he still goes strong. Incidentally, I mean, this is beside the point. The papal nuncio in Ireland, all through, he's gone now, we, we, we banished him to Albania. <laughs> Another American from New York, Charles Brown. He was papal nuncio through all that time that I had my dean. Very correct man, beautifully dressed in the best of clerical attire. And on one occasion, he was being interviewed on our national radio RTE, and the interviewer challenged him about the silencing of Tony Flannery, to which Charles Brown replied, silencing? Every time I turn on the radio, he's on it. <laughs> so at least it seems to John Feehan, there's a quote. In theology, we're held fast in a formulation of what incarnation means that was welded together to still the speculative theological turmoil that was rife in 325 AD. Even though that formulation is steeped in a child's grasp of what creation means. 
this moment, I, for my two nights here, I'm staying with Reggie uh, and enjoying his hospitality. And this morning, I sat down in the church if, for the celebration of the Mass. And they had the card there with the text of the Mass, and I picked it up, and I was looking through the text of the Creed. I find it fascinating, after a lifetime spent up there with the altar, leading it to be now as I've been for the last six years, down the church, observing. I know you shouldn't be observing at the Mass, but inevitably at times we do. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. I nearly know it better in Latin. Credo in unum deum, partum omnipotentum, factor in chilea terra. Do you remember that anyway? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And in his son Jesus Christ, uh, how's this at all? Only begotten son of God. Only son of God. Born of the Father before time began. God from God, light from light, true God from true God. Begotten, not me. Consubstantial with the Father, from whom all things were made. And you know where all that came from? The Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. And as John Fian said, even though the formulation is steeped in a child's grasp of what creation means. And that's the issue. And this is where the problem is going to be. i give you another quote, this time from a, an English, uh, a Church of England theologian of the last century called Charles Raven. This is the way it goes. We as human creatures, limited by our status, cannot speak with knowledge of what transcends our experience. We may lay down certain propositions about the nature of the Godhead. We may support them by inference and analogy, but, and this is the real key of it, but it is sinful pride and great foolishness to talk as if we could define the infinite or formulate absolute truth. We must beware of claiming for our words an ultimate wisdom and inerrant authority. In other words, what he's saying is that the people who defined the nature of God, as we have it in the Creed, in 325 AD, with a very perfect knowledge, even less so than us, and none of us can claim to be able to understand the infinite. What he says about them is sinful pride and great foolishness. And we're stuck with it because it is now at the core of Catholic dogma. And what do we do with it? Okay. In 325 AD, they thought the world was flat. And they thought the earth was the center of the universe. And the sun was bubbling around us. They thought that creation happened in six days. And on the seventh day, God rested. And the best estimate they had of the time that it happened was about 3,000 years before that. OK. So that's what they were working on. So they introduced the story of the Garden of Eden and the sin of Adam and Eve. Now, whether the original writers of that story wrote it as a metaphor or an analogy or a myth, by 325 AD it had become <coughs> reality, <coughs> historical fact. <coughs> now we know the creation, that the universe began, insofar as we can know anything about it, 13.7 billion years ago. And 
that human beings are on the earth somewhere between 150,000 years and 4 million years. And just think of that in the context of one of our, again, core Catholic doctrines, that after the sin of our first parents, God closed the gate of heaven against humanity. And it wasn't reopened until his son Jesus came down and died a horrible death on the cross to appease the anger of God. Okay? Now, while that might have made some little bit of sense, though really very little, if you thought that only a couple of thousand years had passed, consider all the millions and millions and millions of people who lived either 150,000 or 4 million years before Jesus came, and God closed the gate of heaven against every one of them. That's inconceivable. Not only inconceivable, it's utterly preposterous. It makes no sense. If we at the same time believe as we do that God is a loving, gracious Father. So where does that leave another one of the core Christian doctrines, Catholic doctrines, that Jesus came to open the gates of heaven and to save humanity? So you see what I mean when I say that with our new understanding, the challenge to what we would have regarded as basic Christian doctrine is going to be enormous. And I say to myself, what's the chances of church leadership and church structures of authority as we have them now coming to grips with all of this and beginning to redefine it. See the, the kerfuffle that's going on over whether or not the most of the married people could go to communion. It's close enough to causing a schism in the church. Imagine some of the stuff I'm talking about here. <laughs> And she's videoing it on the front door of the future. John Fian and, and lots of others who are writing about this now. Uh, there's two great guys in Australia that you might be familiar with too. Michael Morwood is one. And uh, there's a guy called Kevin Preston. I don't know how well known he would be over here. Uh, he's a layman in Australia, and he has written a book called Who Do You Say That I Am? Marvelous book on this whole topic. But uh, what's beginning to happen now in science, as we discover more about the extraordinary extent of the universe on the one hand, and the incredible, intricate, minutiae of the universe. What's beginning to happen, even among some scientists, is they're beginning to think, this didn't just happen and continue to exist by accident. Like each one of us, for instance, is made up by millions and billions of little particles constantly working together. And the thing that they emphasize about it now is the cooperation that goes on at this minute level in nature to keep us in existence. And not just to keep us in existence, but to keep the whole of creation in existence. As one of the Fian uh, said at a lecture I was at recently, he said, even the simplest of flowers of nature, and the one he picked, now I know nothing about this, but this was the one he picked, the leaf of the flower of a magnolia tree. He said, it's one of the least complex. But he said, even that shares basically the same structure as me and you complexity of human nature is extraordinary. 
And as we're learning all of this, if I get a quote here now, just, just for a minute, I got quotes. Yeah, again, this is for the more, the more deeply we understand the workings of the universe, in particular the living world, and especially the human mind and spirit, denial of an ultimate purpose appears even more hollow and pretty. See what he's saying there? Denial of an, of an ultimate purpose. In other words, the more we're learning about the extraordinary mystery of the universe, the more people are realizing there is some ultimate purpose at work here. So, from a Christian point of view, and uh, the writers that I've been mentioning, what they're saying is that the God that we believe in, the God that me and my ancestors preached about, the God up in the sky, sitting in his throne in heaven. He's not there at all. In fact, heaven isn't there. But the, the divine presence, and I like to use the phrase divine presence rather than God because of all the old connotations that God carries, the word God carries. That the divine presence is actually at the heart of creation. And the creation is not a historical event. Creation is a constant reality, continuing from day to day and year to year and from aeon to aeon. So you see, that's a very different notion of the God, of the divine. And they go from that to say, that that divine presence, that is the spirit that is guiding, that is the ultimate purpose of the whole of creation, that that divine presence is in you and in me and in the magnolia flower and in everything that exists. It's a beautiful notion. And the, the divine presence at the heart of creation is driven by what? It's driven by ultimate love. So that gets us back, you see, to the, to the basic Christian message that Jesus of Nazareth came to tell us about. He used the language of his time because he was a man of his time. And he used the images of his time. But what he said about the Father and the relationship that he had with his Father fits perfectly into, I think, this new understanding of the Divine Presence as a reality not up in the sky, not apart from us, but right with us and in us. And I'm not talking here one of the big disputes that was going on at the time of the Nicene Creed and all of that was this notion of pantheism, that everything is God. They're not saying that. They're saying instead that God is in everything, that God is working through everything. I, I, I have one lovely quote here from um, something of God materializes in every species. Creation is, at its most fundamental, about God's own self-fulfillment in being. In other words, that what God is doing in creation is fulfilling himself or herself or itself or whatever you like to, to, to call it. Creation is the garden God walks in and we are invited to walk with them. And if you put that in the context of the whole climate change and all the challenges faced in that, isn't this a wonderful theology for dealing with that? Now, 
my old friend Amara Kuhn. <laughs> she says, <clears throat> science was fully subservient to religion during the whole history of humanity up to the 18th century. Because religion was the dominant thing all through that period, from the early years of Christianity, when it became the official religion under Constantine. And, uh, religion was the dominant belief. And any scientific discovery, as Galileo found out, unless it fitted into religion, religious belief, it was rejected. But that changed in the 18th century. The 18th century was the era of Newton, of Descartes, of Pascal, <coughs> all believers, but all of the brilliant new thinking about creation and about humanity. And what happened in the 18th century and was really came to its, its fulfillment in, that, in an awful way, you could say, in the French Revolution, was the importance of reason, that now reason became more important than religious belief. And the reaction of the church at that time, and coming right on to our own time, was to reject science. So the conflict was there between religion and science, which was a tragedy. It was a tragedy on both sides, but it was a particular tragedy for the church, because it rejected so much that was so important to be heard and to be listened to. I'm getting near my end, and I hope I haven't you totally confused, because I have myself totally confused. The more I think about this, I say, oh my God. <laughs> Einstein. Einstein was an atheist. You all have the Einstein, you have Albert Einstein. He actually died the same year the child died, died 1955. This quote from Einstein. To be aware that behind all we experience, something is hidden. And that our intellect is in, unable to grasp that something. Now, this is a really interesting from Einstein, the atheist. It's a, the, that our intellect is unable to grasp that something. Something of which the beauty and the majesty come to us only imperfectly and as a feeble ap appearance. To be aware of that something is true religiosity. From Einstein. And he says, in that sense, I am a deeply religious atheist. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have the key there. Put that with the new understanding of the divine presence in creation. That's our way of describing, or not describing, because you can't describe it, but of trying to to in some way get in touch with the notion of the divine presence. And are we saying anything different to what Einstein is saying? Not really. As long as both of us, church and scientist, and I think increasingly we will, realize that we're dealing with profound mystery. We go back to what Charles Raven said in the court I gave earlier in the talk, uh, it's foolishness and great arrogance to try to define the mystery that's at the heart of it all. So that's a big challenge for the church. And I don't know, I don't know how it will go. But I do know this, that unless the church can be open to the discoveries and the understandings of science, and be willing to listen to them, and to engage with them, and to dialogue 
quicker. People increasingly will, as they are doing now, reject Catholic teaching. <coughs> Let's like get up a point, and this is. I'm finishing. I'm finishing with this because you see. The sort of understanding of God that we are talking about now. This is not new, really, because for one thing, the poet said it a long time ago. And I'm really, really fond of Gerald Manley Hopkins. Now, Gerald Manley Hopkins is notoriously difficult to read because he uses language in all sorts of ways, and I'll probably make a mess of it. There's quite a short poem, it's called God's Grandeur. I'll have a go with you. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod, and all is sealed with trade, leaves smeared with toy, and wears man's smudge and, man's, and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, now can foot feel being shot. And for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest, freshness, deep down things. And though the last lights of the black west went or morning at the, at the brown, brisk eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and uh, bright wings. It's a good way to finish, because the Holy Ghost, or the bent world, 